everyone, great to see you all. Uh, what I want to do tonight is convince you that your brain is a bit of a serial liar. And what we're going to do is that I'm going to tell you some things, we're going to do some experiments, which I hope are going to convince you about your brain's lying tendencies. We'll be able to catch it out in some lies. Uh, and what we're going to do then is look at what the implications of that are. But we're going to have some fun and hopefully I'm going to make your brains hurt by stretching into some new ideas but simultaneously convince you that that's actually not even possible. So I'm a sensory neuroscientist. That means I work uh, in how we experience the world and my particular interest is in touch. I've got a colleague, uh, a former UNSW student in fact called Shirley uh, and they've been developing a device called a tickle talker which is a communication device that works through the hand. Uh, and that's of course of interest to me because my main area of sensory interest is in touch. It has a particular interest for Shirley too because Shirley is deaf blind. And so what that means is that she can neither see nor hear. And so last year in the Netherlands, I was at a conference with Shirley and we were in sessions together and it was absolutely fascinating to see how that works. So. There would be a speaker up on stage like me, there would be some slides, uh, and then Shirley would be sitting down the front at a table, uh, but she would have her back to the speaker. And then there would be two other people on the other side of the table, and they are her translation team. And so what that translation team is doing is that they would be looking at the screen, they would be listening to the words of the speaker, and drawing signs onto Shirley's hand so that they could understand what was going on. And so Shirley can speak, and so in question time she could ask questions, but the answers again had to be translated onto Shirley's hand by her translation team. And as you can imagine, that's an extremely intense job for those people. They're sitting there trying to look at the slides, listen to the words, which is why there's two of them. They tag in and out when one of them gets fatigued and the other one takes over drawing these symbols on Shirley's hand. So that might seem a pretty precarious kind of existence. Your knowledge of the world around you depends on this translation team. And you're in the hands of these people. Maybe they're a bit tired, maybe they're distracted, maybe they've got their own agenda, or they are doing things that they think are in your own best interests. But we, in fact, live in exactly that same world. So all of us, our brains are deaf and blind. So the, the sort of practical instance of that, I guess, is that if you're unlucky enough to have to go for brain surgery, maybe you have got seizures or you've got a tumour, you'll have to go under an anaesthetic to drill through the skin and the skull. But usually you'll be woken up during the surgical procedure while they're poking around in your brain and potentially cutting bits out because your brain has got no sensation. Your brain can't touch or feel or see or hear. It depends on its own translation team for that to work. And we call those things receptors. Okay, so we've got receptors in our skin, in our eyes. We say that they transduce a signal, which means that they change something from the environment into a neural signal. So for instance, they're taking photons from these lights and turning it into an electrical signal, which is a neural signal my brain can understand. Uh, and so that translation team is our sole connection with the outside world. But we face that same challenge as Shirley. What about if our translation team is unreliable? And I want to show you tonight that in fact they are. But to get there, we need to take a little digression. So those of you who know me will know that I love puzzles and games. And there's a famous logic puzzle called Knights and Knaves. I don't like that name, so I'm going to call these people uh, yellow feathers and blue feathers. And in logic puzzle land, everyone with a yellow feather behaves one way, everyone with a blue feather behaves another way. And ha, the one of them are truth tellers and the other ones are liars, but I don't know which is which. And so there's lots of clever versions of this. Sometimes you only have one question, but we don't need to be very clever. We can just say something like, there's two plus two equal four. And so maybe the yellow feathers say, yes, it does. Whoop. That way. And the blue feathers say, no, it doesn't. And so now I know the yellow feathers are truth tellers and the blue feathers 
are liars or telling you falsehoods. So what that means, if we think about it, if I have to go somewhere, so these are these logic puzzles are set in some sort of fantasy land, so I'm at a fork in the road, one way leads to the inn and dinner, one way leads to the dragon where I'll be dinner, and uh, I have to find out which way is which. There's a blue feather standing there, I can establish that they're a liar, I can do the two plus two, and they say no, that's not four. And that's absolutely fine, because I say, well, does the left hand fork lead to the inn? And they'll say, well, no, because they're a liar. And so, because I know they're a liar, when they say no, that means yes, and so I have to go left to avoid the dragon and get to the end. Things become more interesting, though, if we think about the case where we're in another logic land, there's yellow and blue feathers. Again, I don't know which is which, but now when I ask them, does two plus two equal four? I'm using hand gestures here because I don't speak the language of these people. And the yellow feather says, pap. And the blue feather says, oil. Well, oh, that seems pretty hopeless. Well, you know, there's two plus two equal four. Okay, well, maybe that's yes, maybe that's no. I don't know, what can I do? So now I'm at my same crossroads. There's a blue feather there. Well, okay, I mm, don't know what this blue feather does, but I want to go to the end and not the dragon. So I say, well, okay. Does the limb lie to the left? And the blue feather says to me, oyo. Well, I don't know what oyo means, but I do know that if they were a truth teller, they would have said yes to my previous question about two plus two. And then if this is the way to the end, they would also say yes. Okay, so if they say the same as what they said before, that's perfect. If they're a liar, when I said there's two plus two equal four, they would have said no, which may have been oyo. But when I asked them this way lead to the inn, they will also say no. They will say exactly the same thing. And so despite me not knowing what kak or oyo means, I can actually navigate perfectly well around this land because I will go to the left if they say the same as they did last time. And I can live happily in this land, do all kinds of things, but never know what those words mean. How that relates to the brain is that we live in a similar system. We've got a translation team, our receptors. They're speaking a language that we don't really understand, and I'm going to show you how that works. So it is fundamental to one type of lie, which because of this setup I'm going to call blue feather lies. And then there are some other lies which I'm going to call blatant lies, which we'll talk about too. But let's let's talk about these blue feather lies. So these blue feather people. They're extremely useful to us. It doesn't matter if they're liars or not, provided they're consistent, we can still make sense out of the world. So, one blue feather liar that we've got actually pops up in vision. Okay, and this is something that drives my students mad because it's, it just seems crazy. So when we look at the world, if you're looking out at an arrow, it forms an image on the back of your eye that's called the retina, and that image is upside down. And so what that means is that if I move my hand up in front of my eye like this, the image on my retina will actually be going down like that. And so students, I think fairly enough, will say to me, well, where in the brain does this get flipped up back the right way so that we can see the world the right way up? And the answer is it never gets flipped over because this is a blue feather line. These Movements are consistent ever since I was born. Whenever my, I moved my hand up in front of my eye, the image on my retina went down. So I don't know what kaka oyo means, but I know exactly that when I move my hand up, I get a particular neural signal and I understand what it is. So in this instance, our brain is lying, yes, okay, in fact, the image is going down and my hand is going up, but it doesn't matter. I can negotiate the world perfectly well. And so these kind of lies, we can never catch ourselves out in. We can find them out through science. Until we understood optics, we could never know this. There's another type that we've only been able to see more recently since we could do neuroscience. And so we have neurons, they're the cells that make up our nervous system. We've got a lot of them. And when they get excited, they release neurotransmitter. 
and that neurotransmitter can then excite other neurons. And so that's the basis of how our nervous system works. There's some excitation, neurotransmitters released or to the next cell. Once we could do neuroscience, we found out a pretty strange fact, which is that in our retina, in the back of our eye, when you put light of different brightness on the retina, so you put some dark on that particular neuron, you put some light on this one, they actually do quite different things. So the dark causes the neuron to release a lot of neurotransmitter, and the light causes it to release less neurotransmitter. In most of the nervous system, more is more. More depolarization, more excitation leads to more activity. But here in our visual system, in our retina, more is less. You get more light, there's less neurotransmitter released. You could say that in fact what we see is not light, we actually see the dark, we're releasing neurotransmitter. But again, it doesn't matter, it's a blue feather light. We can never see the world any other way because this is how our brain has developed. And our translation team, they're just there saying, oi, 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 and we understand exactly what that means, even though they're telling us the blank way. So that's one type of lie our brain tells. And um, I can't prove that to you other than through the power of science. But what we're going to do now is look at some more egregious lies that our brain tells. And these ones we can catch our brain out in. And so what happens here, I mean, I think lies is maybe a little uncharitable, might be fair to call them uh, creative truth telling. Okay, so, so let's have a look at some creative truth telling that our brain does in our own best interest. So if you have a look up at the screen, there's a bunch of words there, and they should all, all look pretty sharp to you. Uh, if they don't, you might need your glasses or go to the optometrist. And what I'm going to do is that I am going to bring those words on gradually. So I'm going to ask you just to fixate where it says fixate. That's easy. And you can use two eyes, doesn't matter. But you need to keep your gaze there, and I'm going to bring the words in from the other side of the screen. And what you need to do is to pay attention to when you can first actually read the word, not when you can see that there's something there. All right, so words are appearing. I don't think anyone will be able to read them yet. And what you should find, it depends a little bit how far away it's in from the screen, is that you probably couldn't read any of the words before either bike or cloud appeared. Okay, and so that shows you that even though a minute ago, all of those words look perfectly crisp and clear. In fact, they're not. Most of your field of view is blurry, very low resolution. In fact, only the very centre of your vision is high resolution and colour. Okay, so that seems a little bit disturbing. But let's, let's try something even more disturbing. So this, again, depends a little bit where you're sitting. But what I want you to do is to bring your finger down in front of your eyes, so you all need to try and do this. And you need to stop as soon as you see your fingertip appear. You can move it from side to side, that's fine. But what I want you to pay attention to is that even though you stopped as soon as your fingertip appeared, you can actually see stuff higher up than your fingertip. You can bring it down, you can probably put it in front of the light. So somehow your fingertip has actually appeared in the middle of your field of view. And worse than that, when I do this, I can actually see a kind of shadowy finger above my fingertip. And so what my brain is doing is that, firstly, it's telling me I can see a whole bunch of stuff that I can't because my fingertip has just appeared out of nowhere. But then it's thought, well, hang on, how can my fingertip appear out of nowhere? It doesn't make any sense. So now it's made up a fingertip, which is created out of nowhere to attach my fingertip through to the edge of my field. So these are what I would call blatant lies, things that we can actually catch our brain out in, uh, but we have to work hard. Many people go through life without knowing that. Why does that matter? Well, I think what it matters for is that it means that our reality is curated for us by our translation team. So Shirley has her team, we've got our team. They're making choices about how the world is Okay, it's not that there isn't a real world, it's just that our view of it depends on this translation team that we've got. 
And the consequences of that, I think, are real world and things that we can learn from. So one, I would say, is that we could all learn to show a little more humility. Okay, the translation team that we have there, I mean, they're fantastic, they're awesome. But they actually only are able to tell us about a very limited part of the amazing world in which we live. So they're a shrimp who can see millions of colours that we can't even imagine. There are animals who can see ultraviolet light, who can see infrared, who can see the polarisation of light. There are animals that can detect the magnetic field in this room at the moment. Animals can, de can detect electric fields. So we see a tiny part of the world that our translation team is telling about, us about. Other animals see a completely different view of the world because their team is telling them something different. I think that means we should treasure this world that we live in and fight hard to protect that biodiversity because there's an amazing range of perspectives out there in the natural world. I think the other thing that we should think about is that we need to show perhaps a little more empathy to our fellow human beings uh, because our translation teams are fallible. And so what I think that means is that it's actually very difficult to communicate. Our translation team, Shirley's team, remember they were dealing with people talking, words on the screen. We're dealing with that all of the time. There's background noise, there's distractions, other thoughts are running through our heads. Actually a very difficult challenge for our translation team. What that means, I think, in the real world is that when you're talking to someone, you've told them something that is blindly obvious and they just can't see it. You just need to stop. Maybe their translation team didn't relay that information to them. Maybe the team was distracted, maybe they were fatigued, maybe they were looking at the wrong place on the screen. They just genuinely did not get the message. So something that seems obvious just may not have got through. And so I think in those circumstances, the thing to do is to stop, take a deep breath, and then try and engage in communication.